what is the biggest surprise about the ruling as as you know about it now and what you were expecting potentially to come out um, as, as you guys saw that? Ask each of you to answer that one directly too. Yeah, I think um, one of the big talking points when the initial proposal was initially released was the fact that the SEC had laid out some maybe slightly unorthodox ruling around emissions accounting. And at the time, a lot of my clients were worried about, because of the rules, uh, their mandated footprints would not be aligned with the footprints that they're currently disclosing. And they would be worried about what are the implications of that? Do we have to restate our emissions for prior years? Do we have to start a whole new accounting process each year? Do we have to change our targets that we've previously set? Um, and a positive surprise of this final version is that the SEC has made the emissions reporting rules a lot more flexible. And so now it's less likely that someone's current emission, uh, emissions footprinting process would be out of line with the SEC requirements. So I'm sure we can get a little bit more into the details of those exact changes in a bit, but that was uh, one thing that stood out for me. Lindsay, how about yourself? What 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 caught you uh, as as the biggest um, adjustment or change or to your expectations of this this ruling when it came out? Yeah, um, I think initially, you know, the way that the SEC had moved forward with the original proposal rule was almost complete alignment with the TCFD recommendations. We saw the same exact wording throughout that proposed rule and we still see a lot of it which i love um, because really the intent of that was really to really inform you know investor decision making however we have seen a reframing and that's attributed to the slew of comments that they received and so they are starting to increase uh Eli, like you mentioned like the flexibility uh, of the disclosure to help uh, i think the ease of the disclosure whether it's changing the format and the definition of what is a short-term risk versus a long-term risk. Maybe we don't have to do short, medium, long for each individual company's different uh, definition of what that means, um, but we're going to also help to make maybe match that up with how investors would use this information. They might really only be caring about that 12-month view before and what happens after 12 months. So uh, that reframing was a surprise for me to see that shift in language. Um, but I think ultimately it will be a, a good and helpful uh, reframing as well. Yeah, good point. Olivia, what about yourself? Yeah, so I'm going to go in a little bit of an opposite direction. I think both Lindsay and Ely kind of mentioned positives, but I do think in what you already stated before, Keith, about scope three, obviously it's kind of been um, talked about and led on for quite a while that scope three would not be included in the final ruling, but I still think that comes as somewhat of a surprise just with the the global playing field that we're on right now um, with California, including full scope three emissions, CSRD, including scope three emissions. All of these um, kind of emerging regulations are, are, are already including those. So for the SEC to not include scope three um, seems like a bit of a gap compared comparatively on a global scale. Yeah, that that makes sense. I maybe ask you directly on this as well. Um, just why do you feel that scope three was removed? What was the what was the driving force there? Because that obviously had a lot of of um, discussion over the last year, really, around where it was going to land around scope three. So, what do you think drove that decision to keep this out of the equation for now? Yep. So I think there's a couple of different concerns. I think the the first concern was the lift that uh, companies will have to take. Scope three obviously is a, a quite extensive um, set of calculations and data that needs to be collected. Um, and it really is a heavy lift on a company and it takes a lot of time and a lot of investment to um, you know, gather data that would be you know, complete and accurate for investor use. I think the other concern here is the standardization that scope three is not yet. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in terms of calculations and data collected, we're not yet at the point, um, I think, in the journey where we're seeing that very standardized across, you know, all companies' processes. Yeah, that, that makes sense. There's the word that you've used there, um, and Lindsay, I'll, I'll go to you as well. You, you've used it in, in kind of your discussion at the beginning here around standardization. And as we think about the landscape of compliance, all these different organizations that have taken a, a, um, 
a step and put requirements out there. Um, again, California, uh, the European side of the equation, what SEC has done now. Uh, Lindsay, you mentioned TCFD as an alignment to the climate risk language that you've seen in, in the organizations. I think that's a big um, a big piece of this that I want to maybe unpack a little bit is the standardization that we're seeing in a ruling like this and alignment with some of these other requirements that a lot of the same companies that have to report to SEC are also going to be required to report to California. So where do you guys see the overlap in those pieces? Because I think that's maybe leading to some of that question, Olivia, you just mentioned around the lift and what is it going to take for my organization to respond to all of this? I can I can take that a bit. Um, so I think in terms of standardization, we absolutely are seeing quite a lot of overlap. Um, I would say that, you know, California is going to be a little bit more I would say robust in in some capacity, mostly because the way that it's been framed is kind of full adoption of just TCFD recommendations as they are. And maybe and the migration of that or adoption of that into ISSB S1, S2. Um, and so with that, I think you're, you're hitting more companies who might be affected, not just public yeah. companies. Um, and we're going to see a much more robust disclosure. However, um, we're also seeing some pretty granular requests, I think, coming out of SEC that are slightly nuanced. Um, so don't want to kind of minimize the level of effort that would take for a first, second, third time going around to be able to prepare disclosure for the SEC. Um, but maybe, Olivia, if you have some additional thoughts there, I'd invite your uh, reaction. Yeah, definitely would would relay the same thing, Lindsay, or something similar where if you do have to report to California, there are a lot of overlaps in terms of emissions reporting. California obviously is a bit more robust, um, especially with the inclusion of scope three. Um, I think if you are preparing for California now, you're likely in a good place for SEC, but still taking into consideration some of those nuanced requirements that SEC has included in their final ruling. Um, I think it's also important to note that, um, as we say, standardization and alignment, right, the whole purpose of all of these for SEC, for California, for CSRD, all of them, the purpose is to standardize reporting and give kind of a one-stop shop um, that investors, stakeholders, customers can use to look at emissions. So while um, SEC maybe didn't require scope three or some of these other um, items, it is important to note that if you are disclosing to California, there may be some serious consideration on voluntarily including your scope three emissions in your SEC disclosure if you're you're already reporting them um, to make sure that there is alignment across all of these uh, different reports or disclosures that your company is putting out there. 